Hi, my name is Tom Karani, and I'm so grateful to the Diocese of Newark for this opportunity to give this talk. Um, thank you for, for joining this virtual conference. It's, it's awesome to have so many people um, participating in this, especially uh, during a time that's, that's pulling so many of us apart. It's great to come together. Today I'm speaking about how technology can be an avenue for building up relationships in our church today. And I know that so many of us during this pandemic have taken some time to evaluate the place of technology in our lives, and a lot of us are just tempted to throw it out the window. We're done with Zoom calls, we're done with videos and things like that. Um, but I truly believe that we need to view technology as a tool for building up relationships in this church. And not, not just because of the time period that we're in right now, but, but because, of, because we're in the 21st century. And because technology is a tool that is so integrated into our lives every day. Uh, it's a part of everything we do. And, and so I think the church really needs to look at this as an opportunity to be bold and creative, as Pope Francis has called us to be. So in 2013, uh, Catholics around the world were challenged by Pope Francis's first apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. This is really like the hallmark, the shining example of Pope Francis's writings. Evangelii Gaudium called us to evangelize in a personal, charismatic manner, right? To preach the kerygma, the cross of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, and his personal love and affection and commitment to each one of us. We were encouraged by our Holy Father to put this message at the core of every initiative of evangelization that we undertook. Every conversation of faith with others were called to preach the kerygma. That's what Pope Francis said in that apostolic exhortation. And this document echoed previous documents and promulgations on evangelization, but as is Francis's style, it projected the work of evangelization in a new light. To the peripheries we go with the salvation of souls in our mind, right? This was sort of the, the clarion call of Pope Francis, go, go out and tell people about Jesus. And in my own initial reading of the document, this charismatic proclamation of the gospel took center stage. It was what I focused on the most. Even after reading it through several times and implementing it in parish ministry, I failed to notice the impact of five simple paragraphs that are smack dab in the middle of this letter. And these paragraphs address what Francis calls the art of accompaniment. While most of the document talks about the content of the kerygma, these paragraphs on accompaniment laid out Pope Francis's vision for the method for delivering the content. He calls, in these, in these paragraphs, he calls all the baptized, ordained, religious, and lay alike, to practice this art of accompaniment. He calls it a relationship that is steady and reassuring, close and compassionate, healing, liberating, and a relationship in which we can grow and become holier. A relationship that helps us to be saints. It sounds like, in this document, the Pope is asking us not only to proclaim things about Jesus, but also to be like Jesus with others. Thankfully, faithful friends led me to understood more about this thing called accompaniment, and I believe it's what our church needs to recover in this moment. We need to recover what it means to live accompaniment in our daily, in our daily lives, especially in this time of pandemic, and especially as we look at the technological tools that surround us, because I believe the two go hand in hand. So first I wanna talk about what accompaniment is, because this is something that our church is trying to work on defining right now at this very moment. This is a, a live discussion in our church. We've, we've heard this from Pope Francis, and we wanna apply it in our daily living as church. And what does it mean? I had the opportunity to co-author a book um, with a colleague of mine, uh, a great friend, uh, on spiritual accompaniment. It's called The Art of Accompaniment, and it's, uh, we published it through the Catholic Apostolate Center. And in that book, we give a definition for what spiritual accompaniment is. Here it is. We say, spiritual accompaniment is the apostolate of intentional relationship that is oriented toward a definitive direction of growth in holiness and transformation in the person of Christ. That is a loaded definition. We use a lot of words. And so I want to break that down really quick. Spiritual accompaniment as an apostolate. That's the first thing. An apostolate is the work 
of the baptized. And so when we call spiritual accompaniment an apostolate, we're saying it belongs to all of us to do this work. Everyone who's been baptized has been given the gifts through the Spirit to go do this work. The work of accompaniment should be everyday work for all of the baptized. It's not just for a few holy people. It's not just for father. It's not just for sister. Uh, it's for you and for me to do in our own small uh, or even potentially giantly significant ways. Second, it's an intentional relationship. It's an apostolate and it's an intentional relationship. Now this is at the core of what accompaniment is. Two people in truly intentional relationship, journeying with one another, sharing life with one another, talking about things of faith, trying to become holier with one another. They exhibit tenderness to one another and deep friendship. Um, this sounds like our relationship with Christ, and that's because the relationship that's shared in a spiritually accompanying relationship, it should mimic that relationship we have with Jesus Christ. Uh, it's someone who walks with us, who is side by side with us as we go through the ups and the downs of life. And now finally, and this is really important, I want to drive this home. Spiritual accompaniment has a definitive direction. That was a part of that definition as well. I think one of the criticisms of this term accompaniment, which is sort of a buzzword now, but um, one of the criticisms of accompaniment as a buzzword is that it seems a little permissive. And, and I just wanna I just wanna say that accompaniment has a definitive direction. It goes somewhere. It doesn't just sit uh, and it doesn't just remain aimless. It's a relationship that goes towards Christ, that heads toward holiness. It's two people striving, walking together to be better, to be more like Christ every day. Now, it's really important to remember that this is called an art. It's the art of accompaniment. It's not the exact science of accompaniment because accompaniment life is messy and accompaniment needs to allow for these messy parts of our life. It needs to allow for forgiveness and it needs to allow us to get back on track and try anew every day. Um, even though it can get messy, accompaniment should never be an opportunity for self-absorption, for, you know, someone to say, I know better than what Jesus has told us or what the church proclaims. Um, it always, always heads towards Christ, and it, it never drifts. It doesn't drift. Um, it's, it's, it's a straight guidepost towards being holy. So, accompaniment is a specific kind of relationship that's guided by the Spirit, and that draws each of us more deeply into the person of Christ by being Christ and desiring Christ for one another. So I just want to give us a moment here to think about this. Imagine relationships like this in your parish, in your school, in your own family. What would it look like if we could live like this day in and day out? I think the church would look very different the church lived, you know, the body of Christ, I, I think that we would, we would be a sight for people to see. And it's also important to know that this idea of spiritual accompaniment, it doesn't just come from Pope Francis. It's truly a rich part of our tradition and our history. It's demonstrated from the very first pages of scripture. God is the foremost accompanier. He walks with his people from Adam and Eve to the Israelites enslaved in Egypt, he remains by their side even when they reject him. He goes even so far as to give us his son, his word incarnate in the flesh who dies for us. He wanted to be with us that badly. He wanted to live with us that badly, not only here on earth, but in eternity. That's how much he loves us. God is the accompanier, and he gives us the perfect example of what it means to accompany one another. But we also see spiritual accompaniment lived out in the lives of the disciples after they receive the Spirit, especially as they're building up the church. We see it in the lives of saints who communicated with one another and supported one another on their own journeys of faith. And we see it to this very day. I'm sure if you take a second to think, you can come up with someone's name or an experience of someone you had who accompanied you in your life or in your faith journey. I really want to encourage you to take time to think about that person. And if you're able, um, express gratitude to them. Tell them thank you. And then commit to being that person for someone else today. 
because that person had a really important impact on your life and they made you who you are today. So, so we see how accompaniment, it's not just a new thing that Pope Francis came up with. It's been a part of our tradition and our history from day one. From the very first moment that God created us, he was with us. And he calls us to do that for one another as well. So now that I've given a very broad overview of what spiritual accompaniment is and what it looks like in our history and tradition, I want to talk about how it relates to technology and how we accompany today. If this is if accompaniment is this thing that's based on intentional relationship and being together, how do we, in this time of pandemic, accompany one another spiritually? How do we walk together towards Christ? I believe that even though the last several months have been full of tragedy and isolation and for some even death, you know, loss of a job, terrible things like this, I believe the church faces a great opportunity in the near future. I believe we're facing a chance to be bold and creative in the, in the ways that we evangelize and in the ways that we talk about ourselves as church. I believe we must regard technology as essential to this renewed mission. And the word technology, it, it can evoke, you know, all these feelings of stress. Uh, or, you know, visions of computers and phones and wires and smart TVs and things that we just want to throw out the window. And there's no, but there's no denying, there's no denying that technology is an integrated part of our lives. Here we are watching a conference, right, on our devices. I'm recording on a device. I've got a setup here. And so it's so integrated in our lives and it's integrated into who we are and it's here to stay. But what does this have to do with spiritual accompaniment? At all. I, I think there's three things that we need to think about. Uh, three reasons it's important for technology and spiritual accompaniment to be thought of in the same in the same sort of idea. First, let me say that technology can never be used as a replacement for in-person relationship. Uh, not permanently, anyway. However, I believe that technology can be at the service of facilitating in-person relationships. And what does this mean? I have very one brief, very one simple example, and I don't want anyone to feel attacked. But if, if your church or school has an updated parish website or church school website, you're doing this. I, and I, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying this in jest. I'm saying this because when I worked at a parish in Austin, Texas, um, Austin is a very vibrant city and people are moving there all the time. And so we always had new people coming to Mass. And most of the young people I would speak with, I would say, hey, yeah, welcome to our parish. How did you learn about us? And eight or nine times out of 10, they always said, well, your website was up to date and it looked good. So I came here for mass. It might seem sort of trivial. It might seem like that's not the right reason to go to a specific church over another church on the Sunday. But I'm telling you that this is how, this is how people find information. This is how people talk nowadays. And so it's so important. And I, I think this is an example. This is not just me griping. This is an example of how technology can facilitate in-person relationships. Because you have a great website, because you have opportunities for online Bible study, because you're hosting small groups for you know young adults, young families, who naturally gravitate towards technology and, and technological ways to get together, Th those people are more likely to be in your church on Sunday, to come to Eucharist, have an encounter with Christ. The website, in my example, was just a part of a funnel to get people there on Sunday so that I could develop a relationship with them and say, welcome to our parish. Here's a way to get involved in our community. And so I know right now things are, with the pandemic, things are very different. But, but this stands true. This holds true that technology can be used as a way to facilitate in-person relationship. It can draw us into community. It can do some of that initial work for us. And, and this intentional relationship, which comes out of this, is the foundation for spiritual accompaniment. So that's the first point. The second point is, uh, I believe that a spiritual accompaniment must look different in this technological world that we live in. Because those who are we are accompanying and those who we are accompanied by are highly influenced by technology. There's no denying that some of us get technology and some of us don't get technology. That's, that's okay. Some of us want to throw our stuff out the window uh, and some of us love computers and this is how we communicate and we get it, right? 
usually these uh, these personalities are delineated by age, and that's that's just because of when technological advances happened. It's just a part of a person's environment. The newly published directory of catechesis takes up this idea and uses the term digital natives and digital immigrants, right? Those who are digital natives have grown up with technology. They understand the language. They get the culture. They speak a certain way. They have certain gifts. Uh, they have certain habits, good and bad. And the same goes for the digital immigrant. They have a different language. They have sort of a different culture. And so the challenge is for these two in some way to come together. The other challenge is uh, for these two groups to understand one another. And I just want to make a point about the digital native. And this is echoed in the directory. Um, the directory says that digital natives in general prefer images over arguments. This is part of the language that they speak. They are motivated by stories. And in fact, the directory says that the language that's most appealing to the digital native is that of the story. Our accompaniment of the digital native should prioritize stories. The story of Jesus, the story of God's fidelity to his people Israel, your own faith story, their own faith story. Ask the digital native questions. Who are you? Tell me about what you believe in or what you don't believe in. Get ready to listen to their stories. Listening is an essential part of spiritual accompaniment. That's so important to accompanying digital natives today. It's, and it's so important to realize that their, um, their environments are different, that they've grown up differently. And so we need to be there with them, walking with them uh, as, they, as they search for God, as they search for meaning. Finally, I just wanna say a word about catechists during this time, because I believe that this is a time for catechists to truly recover their vocation as catechist. I'm currently an employee at Catholic Faith Technologies, and our company provides digital learning solutions to Catholic organizations. And this is not a pitch. I just wanna speak from my own experience. One of our platforms called My Catholic Faith Delivered is a method of delivering catechetical instruction to students of all ages um, online. It's an online platform. And the idea is you do learning online, and then you come together in person for a shared experience of faith, whether it's prayer, faith sharing, church tours, whatever, what have you. In my recent work with My Catholic Faith Delivered and the thousands of parishes that we've recently onboarded, I've been blown away by the stories of catechists and directors of religious education who have adapted and who have really recovered what their vocation means as catechist in this time. They're rediscovering that a catechist is not only a transmitter of facts and data, a transmitter of theology, but the catechist is a person who shares faith who reveals the mystery of God, who embraces life. The catechist, the Pope says, and the, and the directory of catechesis says, should be an expert in this art of accompaniment. One catechist I spoke with recently said that he was excited to speak with his students outside of the classroom so that he could have faith conversations with them and with their families. He wanted to ask them where they saw God in their week. This is a huge, it's such a simple question, but it's a huge thing for spiritually accompanying relationships. Questions. Where did you see God? And then what do you do after you ask a question? You listen. And what an awesome opportunity to engage families, to engage the entire domestic church, and not just the students in the classroom. I spoke to a DRE last week. Last week I spoke to a DRE who said that she was giving her catechists talking points and questions so that they could go to their students' families and have domestic church conversations to encourage prayer outside of praying before meals, to encourage a rhythm of life in this time of pandemic. Amazing, amazing things from our tradition and empowering a catechist to go beyond the resource kit, the, the catechist guide, and to ask these parents and students to integrate faith and the mystery of God into their lives. I was blown away. It's amazing. And so this is what I mean when I say this time of technology, this time of being apart, there are, there are very tragic elements to it. Now, I'm not denying that. I'm not downplaying that at all. But I do see an opportunity for our church here. 
I see an opportunity to be bold and creative, as Pope Francis says in Evangelii Gaudium. I see an opportunity to use technology as a tool to break down isolation, to share life with one another, and to accompany one another. Um, the point is that we can be so discouraged by the situation that's around us, but if we're open to the Spirit, I believe he'll show us brand new ways to be church with one another. In closing, I just want to reiterate, this is a time of great opportunity for the church, a time when we can define what accompaniment means in our church, and a time when we can live it out boldly and creatively as we utilize technology that's around us. Thank you so much 